that we get it. So we're going to be in John chapter 12 this morning. Look at another time that Jesus was anointed. Um, and see another opposition to it. And see what Jesus has to say about it. And what Jesus wants to speak to us this morning. So let's pray before we open up our words. But we're going to be in John chapter 12. It says, uh, let's pray. God, I just thank you that you're here with us. I thank you that, God, your presence is here. We thank you for your Holy Spirit being here. We thank you that, God, your words are powerful. Uh, Father, I was reminded yesterday, God, that your words are, are sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide soul and spirit, uh, joint and marrow. God, I thank you for your words that, that can pierce our hearts. And so this morning I pray that, it would, that your word would go to the deepest part of who we are, encourage us where we're at, and God challenge us to be more like you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I had a friend, uh, a friend from high school yesterday post on Facebook, describe, describe what you do in scary and make it sound scary. And uh, she was a nurse, so she talked about poking people with needles. And I said, wow, I have the honor on a regular basis to, to speak words that have the power to change people's lives and has the power to divide between uh, soul and spirit. Tomorrow and joint, and I was like, wow, yeah, that sounds really hard. And then uh, somebody re somebody replied, that sounds like really powerful words. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a humbling opportunity to speak every Sunday. So we're in John chapter 12 this morning, and we're going to begin with reading uh, verse 1 here. It says this, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him here. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. This house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Judas, one of his disciples, he was also about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And Jesus replied, Jesus said to him, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And so we see this another amazing dinner happening, uh, another celebration uh, that's happening, and prepared is an anointing. But prepared is a, uh, it says here, a, a pound of nard, uh, a, a huge amount of ointment, and it was lavishly displayed as an act of worship the Lord, to Jesus. So we can look a little bit at the background of this story this morning. This is at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so a couple, oh, it's about a month ago, we talked about this story, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, right? And he has the power to raise people from the dead, to raise us out of our situations, to, you know, to bring life into us. And so as we looking at this passage this morning, the backdrop of it is uh, Jesus is going to the house, and it says here in verse 1 that, um, that this was where Lazarus was, but secondly, in verse 2, they gave a dinner for him. So this was a, this was a dinner that they were having in honor of Jesus, kind of like a, a celebratory thing. Hey, G Jesus, you just raised Lazarus from the dead? Well, we're going to go all out. We're going we're gonna to spread, uh, get it spread out. We're going to celebrate you. Would you come and join us? And so it, it isn't uh, like super clear here, but, but this act from Mary seems like part of this whole thing. It, it was a planned celebration. It was a giving of this meal. It was a giving of this worship to Jesus for what he had just accomplished in raising Lazarus from the dead. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a place where they were in full honor of Jesus. They were excited and they were full of wonder. They were full of gratitude because Jesus 
had displayed his resurrection power in their midst. And we'll see uh, towards the end Jesus' reply that, uh, that, they should, that they should keep it. And I'll answer some of the questions around that later. What was he instructing, uh, or what was he replying when he said at the very end that they should keep this for the day of my burial? And I, I think I have some really encouraging things that we can glean from that as we look at it. But Jesus tells the story, that, or John tells the story that it was six days before uh, the Passover. It was six days before they were getting ready to celebrate the Last, uh, the last Supper, before Jesus is going in uh, to, to be arrested. And so this is right at the end of his life. This is a celebration of, hey, Jesus, you have done amazing and awesome things. So in verse 3, we see that this, it begins to describe this scene of gratitude. So it, it starts this, and how do we know this? Um, I was reading with Linda this week. We got to go and visit Linda uh, in, in her room over on the east side of town. Again, you've heard it already, but go see Linda and spend some time with her. And encourage her in the Lord. But we were reading some scripture, and it started with a therefore. And she, and she was right on it. She said, Andrew, if there's a therefore there, we have to go see what it's there for, right? And so here again in, in John 12, I, when, I, when I read this again this week, I just laughed and remembered that moment sitting there with Linda. And so we read like three chapters of Hebrews together just so we could get to the, the original statement before all the therefores. But this morning, we don't have to go that far to, uh, to see that. Um, in verse 3, the therefore there, Mary therefore took a pound it was, it was because, again, this, because of this gratitude, because of what Jesus has done, has raised Lazarus from the dead. Therefore, Mary is about to express to him with this abundant gift, this praise and this honor and this gratefulness for, why, uh, for what Jesus has done, for what he represents. For he represents the power that is, that, that is to raise from the dead. I was just thinking, in our situation as a church, you know, what what do we come and praise for? What was the Psalms written all over and over again? God, because of what you have done, you are you are worthy, you are praiseworthy, you are you are wonderful. And then, and then other psalms get into just stating who he is. God, you are holy, you are mighty, you are you are there, you were from the beginning, and you'll be forever, right? And and this in our life, though, is a motive for our our worship, for our expression of worship, the worship. And to look at what God has done in our life and say, yes, God, I, I praise you because of where you brought me from. I, I praise you because your power has been demonstrated in me. I praise you because of the salvation that I have in Christ Jesus. The size of this, uh, sorry, this ointment or this perfume, it was, it was a large amount. Uh, recently, uh, it was, la it was it last year for my birthday, I think it was, or it was sometime in the last year, we went to go get, um, I needed some cologne, like I don't have a lot of cologne. I don't know, have you guys ever gone shopping, Dad told the story of shopping for the white diamond for Mom, the specific perfume she loves, but you go to these, uh, you know, go to Macy's or something like that, and they got, you know, like this spread of different colognes, and, they, and I'm like, it's like one ounce of cologne, it's a hundred something dollar, but I don't, I don't give me the Adidas stuff, you know, 24 bucks, it's good, you know, right? But, but here we, we see that this, this size, it was a pound, about a liter, about maybe like a size of a, a soda pop can, right? But this was an expensive perfume. So 300 denarii, we're like, all right, it's, it, that's, a, that's a few days, days waited. But it's like about $25,000 perfume. It smelled really good. It was, it was really good stuff. So, in in eyes of Judas, this thief, this one that he man, crooked, about to sell Jesus for what he says, some coins of silver, right? Thirty coins of silver, about a thousand dollars. We see, we begin to see this contrast. Knowing the end of the story, we can see this contrast of how worthy. The difference between how worthy they thought Jesus was, how worth it he was. Where we have this comparison where Mary, 
Man, I'm about to give life savings. I'm about to give the family, uh, what the, the, sorry, I'm about to give like a huge sum of money, $25. And, and then Judas here, thinking Jesus, man, Jesus is only worth about a thousand, about a thousand bucks all I need to, to put the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Savior of the world, the Messiah to death. There's a huge difference in the word. And this is something that I want to encourage us in. And last week we talked about our expressions of worship, not to allow other people's self-righteousness to hinder our expressions of worship. In, in this moment here, out of what was done for her, then springs up this a moment of worship. And I, and I encouraged us last week, and I'll encourage us again, sometimes we need to meditate on what God has done for us. Even just the simple fact of salvation should be enough for us to understand, Jesus, you're worth it all. There, there's nothing that would hinder my worship from you. There's nothing that I can hold back from you because, Jesus, you didn't withhold anything from me. Amen. And it seems here that Mary kind of gets this point. Jesus, you're, you're worth it all. You're worth my lack of security. You, uh, talk about, let's talk about, is, is having something that is of this valuable, this represents security for the family. This is future. This is inheritance. This is, this is that kind of level of worship. That's that kind of level of craziness to pour out upon God. And it would encourage us, I believe the Lord would encourage us in, in the same way. He's worth it. He's worth everything. He's worth whatever you've been thinking is uh, is ridiculous for him. I think that, that's what God. This would not just be ridiculous for me to give up that much time. It would be ridiculous for me to give that uh, amount of money. It would be ridiculous for me to serve in that way. It would be ridiculous. It would be too much. And understand here, Mary is. I think through the scripture this morning, we're challenged by Mary's uh, expression of worship. That that Mary's example is. Hey, it's worth. He's worth it. He's worth whatever we got, and whatever he asked of us, he's worth it. In verse 4, we start to see this response, Judas's response to this, in verse 4 and 5. So let's look at Jesus, Judas's response. He says, um, Judas is one of the disciples. He was about to betray Jesus. In verse 5 it says, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. Jesus really wasn't worried about the poor. John tells us in verse 6 that Judas' heart, Judas said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Having charged of a money bag, he wanted to help himself with some of the proceeds. I don't know how much Judas would have been able to dip out of twenty-five thousand dollars worth of uh, worth of um, money getting in, but he had his eyes on a selfish gain, and he was he he focused on himself and what he could gain from himself rather than what was owed and what was due to Jesus. I think in verse seven, Jesus replies, "Leave her alone, so that." She may keep it for the day of my burial. I think there's three reasons that we can glean from Jesus speaking. Three reasons why he told them to leave, he told Judas to leave Mary alone. So we're going to examine those this morning. The first reason is in verse 8. It says, leave her alone because you do not always have me with you. The beginning of verse 8, leave her alone because the poor you will always have with you. And the third reason we're going to look at is leave her alone so that she might she may keep it for the day of my burial. So there's three statements of, of leave it alone. Leave her alone. Allow her to express herself in that way. Allow her to worship me in that way. First reason, you do not always have me with you. The time is now. The time is is now in our worship. In this story, here we see it's at the backdrop right before Jesus' physical body was about to go through torture, was about to go to the cross, was 
Well, it's, it, in, in the foreground is that Jesus is going to be um, buried and raised again, right? So they're not going to have him physically with them any longer. Like, he, he's about to leave. This is a, he's saying, hey, allow her to, to come. Allow people to, to come to me. And I would say this to us as a church. What was, it, what was this in 21st century Capital City Church, Madison, Wisconsin. What is God saying to us? You, you, you don't, you don't have much time. Like I'm returning. Like, like part of the thing, oftentimes when I'm thinking about a sacrifice, when I'm thinking about something that God's asking me to do, sometimes my delay in obedience or my de de delay in responding to God is, you know, like, hey, it's not the right timing, or, or hey, it make it might cost a lot. It might require much of me. And so there's a delay in my response. There's a delay in my obedience to, to go after fully what God has for me. And and here in verse 8, it says to them in this room, because you don't always have me with you, uh, but and to us, room, hey, you're not always going to have the time. We, we never know the hour. We never know the day. We never know when, when he's returning. We don't know. Like, hey, I just... Walked to was right in here. Somebody was in a car accident. They seem to be physically okay. We never know when those moments are going to happen. And so the encouragement to us is obedience now. Obedience uh, all out for him now. When what he asks, uh, what he requires, he he's worth it. Go for it now. Don't delay. Anybody, anybody need to hear that? Okay, God. Let me be encouraged by that. Let me be encouraged by that. Uh, he's worth it now. Don't delay. Leave her alone because the poor you will always have with you. He's really saying, Jesus is saying this, the poor you will always have with you. Uh, not, uh, not because he was speaking to the fact that uh, you know that they should they should go do something for the poor, he was really getting at the the heart of what Judas's uh, Judas's heart was about. Is that hey, he really wanted it for himself. He really was concerned with the poor. But when I as I examined this, I was thinking about this thing in First Timothy chapter six, verse seven and ten. This is a words from Paul. It says this, We brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of this world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will become content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Jesus was saying to Judas, Bethlehem, the love of, or to, to Judas and to Bethlehem and to us today, the love of money, the desire to be rich, it, it's crazy. It, it leads to death. It, it's destructive. It, it blinds you to my worth. So, so what Jesus is saying is, is I, I'm worth that praise. I'm worthy of it. I, I deserve it. And, and it's crazy to think, right, because there's a lot of good things I want to do. Right? There's a lot of good things in the church we want to do in the city, right? There's, a, there's I think, some, some worthwhile things that we can invest in and give our time to and our finances to, so that, right, so that people are changed and people are affected by the gospel and affected by Jesus. And, and what God says so. What, what's the more? What you do the thing here? What's the more important thing? What's the goal of it? Don't get caught up in the good things. Don't, don't come get caught up in the reward of things. Don't get caught up in the accolades of things. Don't get caught up in the praise of things. Don't get caught up in yourself receiving because Judas, right? He wanted to receive some of that uh, that money when he's coming. He said, "Don't get caught up." He said, I, "I'm worthy of it. Do it for me. Do it towards me. Be in all of me." Be full of me. Be desirous of me. Worthy. I'm worth it. And so then, if we see this, this unfold in our lives, and this is, you know, talk about an element of discipleship, right? I could teach people, and we could teach people in discipleship, right? All the right things to do. 
There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good things to do. But the, if their eyes of the disciple is not fixed on Jesus, then, then the rest of it just gets it's out of order. It gets, it gets messed up. And, and so what, what Jesus is encouraging us to do, hey, you'll always, have the poor, you'll always have the good things to do, but you won't always have me. Fix your eyes on me. Uh, I am worth it. And then all these other things will happen. It, it, that's the principle in the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things, right? Judas, you, you were looking out for yourself, buddy. You really, you really didn't care about the poor. You were kind of going after accolades and, and security and, and wealth, but it pour it on me. I, I'm more worth it. I, it's benef, more beneficial that you pour it out for me than to do these good things. Because the good things will follow those that are in awe and worship and focused on, on him. Not much, it's not a statement of, of Jesus not liking the poor as much as it is the recognizing that he's worth our full attention and our full displays of worship and sacrifice. The third point, the third reason Jesus said to leave Mary alone was that she said in verse 7, Leave her alone so that you may keep it for the day of my burial. This is a really interesting uh, passage. Some of, some of the passages talked about, uh, as I was studying out, some of the researches were saying uh, that this was, this was kept for my burial instead of, uh, the English could be changed maybe, instead it was that she may keep it for my burial. She's already like poured it out, and they were talking about that maybe they had saved this up for this special occasion. Uh, for Jesus' burial, and, and so in, in that manner. Um, but what we can see here even further is Judas, this comparison again between Judas being upset about this and, and, the, and Mary being excited and being full of joy, being full of zeal, being encouraged, being ready for this, being waiting for this, being, being in expectation, her amazing and wonder, her love was poured out for him. And she said, let her keep this. Let her keep this wonder. Let her, let her keep this amazing. Let her keep this moment. For the day of my burial. When I, when I die, when I, if I could, don't allow this zeal, this wonder, this love to be squashed. Don't, don't allow it to be hindered. Don't allow it. No, a, she needs to be excited about what is about to happen just as this day, what has happened. See, because it, again, it's in, the back, it's in the backdrop of Lazarus being raised to dead. All right, so she's in awe and wonder and she's worshiping and she's pouring out this expression of love and, and taking, taking his feet and wiping it with her hair. I mean, right? The, is this, a, this was on his head. That she, you know, this is feet. It was a, the lowest place. The, the, greatest, the greatest offering that we have is worthy I mean, of just being wasted at his feet, at the dirtiest, the lowest place of Christ. He says, I, I let her keep it for the day of my burial. Why? Because there, there's about to come a day when it looked like it was the end. The story ended again, like there, right? Like Lazarus, just as Lazarus was laid in the bed, and laid in the ground, and there was mourners everywhere. And Jesus came in, right? And remember the story. He came into the situation, and they were mourning. They, they were like, Jesus, if you would have been here earlier, if, if you could have got here, this, it wouldn't have happened this way. And he says, let her keep it for the day of my burial. Let her keep this wonder and awe and excitement about my ability to raise Lazarus. Because, because when I'm laid on the ground, there's going to be somebody who's saying there's going to be somebody that's going to believe that it's, it's going to happen again. She can keep that zeal. And man, what does that speak to us today? God, God, when He does things in our life and, and He brings us through to the other side and there's a testimony that we can have, we can use that word, of what God has done in our life, man, keep that zeal. Why? Because then, when, when, someone, when, when our neighbor hey, needs 
when Linda's sick in the sick in the bed and she needs somebody to come by and say, "Hey, Linda, you're not going to stay there forever. God's going to raise you up." We need we need to keep that zeal. When we have a testimony of God's healing power or God's restorative work, and we see somebody in a relationship that, "Hey, things look destructive. It looks like it's going to be bare." We need somebody there that's going to say, "No, I mean, I know. I've been there. I saw God that way, and trust me, He's worthy. He, he's able. He, he can come through again." Right. These, this is why Jesus instructed Judas, allow her, leave her. This is for my burial. Let her keep it. Keep going in it. And so an ending for us today, keep going in it. Keep going in the excitement to know, yes, God, you have done it. And maybe some of us are still in the mess and we're thinking, all right, uh, I, I need that encouragement. I need somebody to, to keep it. I need somebody to, to, to remind me what he's able to do. Man, this is what the word is about this morning, that, hey, he's done it. Lazarus was raised from the dead. He, he's worth it. He, he's powerful. He, he's able, no matter what it is. So Bethlehem. So Capital City Church. Sorry, Beth, Bethlehem. Talking about the, the city of Bethany, Capital City Church. If any voice tells you to moderate your love for Jesus, don't listen. Amen. That's right. He's worth it. He's worth our praise. He's worth. He's worth everything. Twenty-five thousand dollars. I don't. I, that's, a, that's a crazy expense. I'll be like, hey, I got. I got better things I do. I got. I got a kid now, right? I got. I got to. I got to watch out for him. I got to be able to pay for things that he wants to do. I got. He, no, it, he's worth it. Oh, I got time. I got this. Is, this thing on my life and this thing on. No, hey, he, he's worth it. Let your affections for Jesus be lavish, be crazy, be ridiculous, because it will match what he has done for us. If any voice tempts you to want to be rich in money, don't listen to it. And if anything wants to tempt you to, to, to go after accolades and go after the praise and go after the attention, don't listen to it. Jesus is our riches. What money can give for us, what, what success can give for us, what the praise of the people can give for us, it doesn't compare to what we have in him. Or if any voice tells you that his death is anything less than a triumph over death, don't listen. Hear that again? If any voice tells you that Jesus' death is anything less than a triumph over death, don't listen. Don't listen. He is the resurrection and the life. He is, we're saying this morning, he is the victory. He is the Amen. He is the one that's able. Whoever believes in Him, though Jesus died, we shall live. And everlasting life. And whoever lives and believes in Him, you're right, Denver, shall never die. Right? And this is this is the this is the praise that we have. This is the the place that we sit in. This is the life that we now live. Is that in Him? He has accomplished all things, and now, man, all I have is all allowed for Him. And here again we see in this uh, uh, moment of anointing in John chapter 12, that Jesus again displays Himself as worth it all, withholding nothing, for the sake of Him receiving praise. Do you bow my head and bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you did it all for us. We thank you for the way that your life was poured out for us. We thank you for the way that you were willing to go to the cross, even for our on our behalf. God, I thank you for the way that you resurrect our lives, where you come through it, and we can look. Every one of us can look back and see, God, your hand was on us. Your hand came through. You, you displayed your power. Father, this morning we just declare, I want to declare, even if nobody else would agree, God, I declare that you're worthy. 
You're worth it all. And a word like today, God, it's, in, it's encouraging to know what you're able to do and what you've done for us and to think upon that. But it's also challenging to think, God, there's, there's, there's acts of love, there's acts of expressions of work that you would have for us that sometimes challenge our safety nets. It, it challenges our security. It challenges our way of life. So God, I pray for Catholic City Church. God, that we would live life that reflects your work. That we would live a life that reflects your work. Encourage, another, encourage us in that, Jesus. That just as you gave everything, Father, we would be willing to give everything. God, I pray this in the